Dissect and analyze President Buhari's 100 days in office and uh, how the outlook for his second term uh, is panning out. I'm now being joined in the studios by Senator Shewu Sani, who was part of the 8th uh, National uh, Assembly uh, that has just gone by you. Very warm welcome to you. And I also have a politician and human rights activist, Prince Kasim Afebua who is a member of the opposition People's Democratic Party. Very warm welcome. It's a pleasure. And to the extreme left is uh, a public affairs analyst of the Democratic Alliance, George Agbakai. Gentlemen, let's set the ball rolling. It is another 100 days in the annals of this administration. Nigerians you know, are filled with a mixed bag of uh, what has been achieved and what is on the ground. Uh, Senator Sani, you were part of the ruling uh, party in the first four years of this administration before crossing over to the uh, People's uh, Redemption. Redemption Party. What are your assessments now? <coughs> Would they be different from the four years when you were part of the party? Uh, thank you very much. Well, first of all, uh, 100 days has been a tradition in the political plans when it comes to assessing and appraising the performance of new government in office. And um, 100 days means three months. And if we are to fairly and objectively assess the performance of President Mohamed Buhari and his government. We can only do that by putting into cognizance the aspect we want to reflect on. Uh, when we said assessment or appraisal, it means that you pick on an issue and then you give your scores on what it is. Now, let's start from the achievements. Uh, we must appreciate that the government has, in most ways, been able to demonstrate that it was committed to completing projects uh, abandoned or left behind by the previous administration. As we have seen in areas of roads, uh, airports, uh, railways, and so many other things. So it has been a problem in our country where government come in and refuse to continue with projects left behind. So in that aspect, we can uh, give them a positive score. But now, let's take an example of security. Uh, we shouldn't forget that when this government come into office, uh, three areas that it has clearly spelled out as its areas of interest uh, security, the economy, and anti-corruption. Now, we pick on the security. Yes, I have seen postings where uh, the spokesperson and spin doctors of government do try to remind us that there are no bomb blasts now and people can do their Salah or Christmas in peace. But for those of us, particularly people like me who come from Kaduna, uh, kidnappings and banditry in the northwestern part of Nigeria has seriously eroded any achievement this government could have presented forward and said, this is what we have achieved. Villages have been ransacked, people have been killed and kidnapped. Millions of Naira has been paid as ransom. Families have been impoverished. And we have reached a point where bandits have become an authority unto themselves. This has never been so bad in the history of this country. So uh, banditry, that is the assessment. And as of the Northeast, yes, <coughs> the Boko Haram are finding it difficult to reach to Abuja. But it will be a self-deceit for anyone to think that the group has been defeated in view of the fact how audacious the attack has been in Meduguri, 
and other cities around and how they have become so emboldened in the last few years. That is an issue. So now we pick on power. Uh, all the promises made by this administration and addressing the power problem has come to naught in the sense that uh, we have moved from darkness to darkness and things have not actually improved. It has no clear direction of what it wants to do. Today it will blame the discourse. Tomorrow it will say they need to be abolished. Next tomorrow they want to recapitalize it. They virtually have no direction of what they want to do. On energy, unfortunately the government is in its fifth year term and we are now 100, years, 100 days out of the second uh, time. time. And all the refineries in Nigeria are down. And we have reached a point where the culture of importing finished petroleum product and subsidizing importation of petroleum product has been the case. So on the economy, every government that comes to power will clearly spelled out that this is our economic direction, whether to the left, whether to the right. And these are steps we need to take in order to achieve those things here. And it's also clear in this field that nobody except those people in government can tell you that this is where we want to go economically. So for now, I will give this as my own take before for, we for a hundred days yes, okay yes. let me let me uh, come to kazim afebua because you've uh, tried to uh, look at uh, the issues you know uh, plugging the body polity but hundred days i mean if in the first uh, hundred days it took him uh, six months or in the first it took him six months to appoint his cabinet it's only taking him 55 uh, days to appoint his, cap his cabinet and a lot of Nigerians have loaded the mixed grill of technocrats, uh, politicians <laughs> and the rest making up the cabinet, you know, mm -hmm. that this is a vehicle that will really uh, drive the agenda of this administration. J just in, in two minutes, you know, before we take a short break. Well, I, I, when you say 55 days, that's, that, that's, to me that's not an achievement. I expected that on the 29th of May that the president would roll out his cabinet members because elections were concluded February 27th. It was announced. He knew that May 29th would be his termination day for the first term. And he also knew that uh, he would need a new cabinet. I expected that given the fact that it's a continuum, so to speak, for now, that he would put the right machinery in place to ensure that he gets the right people. But May 29 came, there were no bubbles. May 29 came, there were no sun bites. May 29 came, there were no evil speeches that would reassure the country about the second term. Uh, we were told that on the 12th of June that there, were, there was going to be a, a, like a, a, a golden speech, so to speak, you know, that will signpost the direction of government. June 12th came, the bubble burst. So for me, I think uh, the APC-led federal government seems to be at sea with what to do with power in terms of political power. They, 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 they appear confused, not being able to focus on the essentials that are contained in their manifesto. In the manifesto of the APC, we have about 21 items. And in the first four years, one will expect that they will be able to at least address 10 of those items. But since they came on stream, virtually all the items in their manifesto, upon which this mandate was gotten, have been issued, have, have been jettisoned. So to that extent, you know, you don't think uh, there is anything to write or about the 100 days? Okay. Um, would have more views um, and you're watching the Arise interview, there'll be plenty more, like I said. So you stay with us after this uh, commercial break. You're welcome back to the Arise interview where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the world and featuring the voices at the heart of the stories. I am Christian Ogodo. Thanks for staying with us. 
Okay, we're still assessing President Muhammadu Buhari's 100 days in office. Let me go to the public policy analyst now, George Agbakai. George, as a public policy analyst, would you uh, not agree that the president is driving and propelling, you know, the nation in the right direction, as he has promised? Thank you very much for having me. You know, the, the issue about 100 days in office, in my own view, is being misconstrued by the majority of Nigerians. I remember 100 days in office first started with Franklin Roosevelt, you know, in the United States in the early 30s, when he got into power, you know, immediately after the Great Depression, you know. And what he did essentially, you know, was to enact laws, proclamations that would drive government policies. You know, I think in Nigerian situation, like I said, you know, people have tried to politicize the issue of 100 days in But are we seeing those policies that, can drive, that are driving the nation? You know, are the, they on the, ground? The, the point I'm making is that 100 days in office, we don't need to see major accomplishment in terms of, you know, um, infrastructural development. But what, what is what, significant? What, what we'll be looking at are policies that will drive government policies, policies that will drive you know, developmental initiatives. I think um, in the current dispensation... Let's look quickly at the economy from your viewpoint. Take, for example, when the National Bureau of Statistics released the uh, statistics um, December 2018, for example, of the rate of unemployment, that was the last quarter of that year, it was 23.1%. Earlier in 2018, it was 18.1 percent. Can you see the rise? That's about over five percent rise. And now the same NBS is forecasting that by 2020, unemployment rate in Nigeria is going to be 33.5 percent. What concrete policies, economic policies? are on ground to reduce the employment rate, increase the GDP uh, index of Nigeria. The GDP is at uh, a growth rate of about 1.6 or 1.9 percent. That's really poor. Yeah, you know, when we, when we try to, you know, measure the economy, uh, we have to do a comparative analysis. Which, in, 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 which in, the no, no. MBS has done. Yeah, no, no, no. What I mean is a comparative analysis by way of looking at other African countries. I think it will be irrational for us to look at develop. Why do you want to look at other African countries? They may not have the same circumstances like you. Togo does not have oil. If they have oil, it's not in the same uh, commercial quantity like Nigeria. So why would you want to do that? Okay. We also have to look at the developed countries of Africa, such as South Africa, which perhaps has about 28% unemployment rate. Egypt has about the same with Nigeria. I know, but the, the issue... So it's okay the, if Nigeria's own, you know, grows to 33.5% no, no, by not, next year? No, no, that's not what I'm saying. I know that the government needs to do a whole lot, you know, to improve the economy. And so far, I think the government has consistently worked on improving agricultural development in Nigeria in such a way that Nigeria exports some agricultural product, thereby bringing in some foreign exchange earnings. You know, but there is a, a particular issue which the government has done in respect of these 100 days in office, which I believe you know, is good to note, and that is even though it is in the constitution. That is the issue of making local government independent. I know previous administrations have come and talked about The financial about independence yes. is just being enforced exactly. by the NFIU, right? I think it is 
a good idea is an idea. That, that was a creation first from uh, the eight uh, national assembly yes. okay but uh, let me put you on pause there uh, because uh, senator show sani and kazima febwa you know they were gnashing their teeth while you were trying to give your own uh, position that we should compare <laughs> nigeria's developmental growth or unemployment rate with that of uh, south africa and egypt is that <laughs> going to be a basis for the economic prosperity of this country and particularly the employment rate of you know the youth which uh, has made Nigeria to be described as the world's capital of the poorest of the poor people where they live. Senator? Well I, I understand uh, the point he was coming from and what he is trying to arrive at but we have reached a point in this country where, from where I come from, we are not even talking about poverty and unemployment. We are talking about how people can live with their lives. A situation where bandits and their hundreds of thousands are killing people and kidnapping people even in cities. And it has become such a rocket science for a nation of ours with army, police, air force, navy, and all myriads of security agencies, it is baffling. When the president said he is determined to lift over 100 million people out of poverty in the next 10 years, and they have lifted five in the last four years, we are not even asking that the government should leave people out of poverty. What we want even is how people can live with their lives. Because it has reached a point now. Kidnapping has built an economy around affected areas. So I wonder, if there is a difference assessing his first 100 days on the first annual. But his second 100 days in the second annual is a continuation of what he has been doing. And we cannot be talking of policies when at this time you shall be consolidating on what you have achieved. We cannot say that there has not been achievements. Like I've said, the government has been working hard to complete projects that have been abandoned. And we Infrastructure. Yeah, projects, yes, yeah. and we have seen how they have also, uh, the president has accented to the bill on the NFIU. It's unprecedented because many of the past presidents have refused to do that. Now the local government have their autonomy, as he said, but that is our own effort in on drive at the 8th Senate. But now, the first primary responsibility of government is the, the well-being, the safety and security of the nation. We are under attack. We are under siege as a nation. I can't travel from Kaduna to Abuja without going to queue. And the station. Station. You can see army officers coming to Just railway station. stations with their ammo tanks and joining the train to Abuja, which, which is 150 kilometers from here. Now, how can we have a government where bandits now sit down on the sofa comfortably, sipping tea, biting crackers, and giving us conditions for peace? What kind of country are we living in? Shall we say, should we be proud that we have reached such a point? You are talking of bandit not insurgents. There's a difference. Insurgents have a certain theocratic or philosophical ideas or beliefs they're pursuing. But bandits are pure criminals. And to reach that point, we have become worse than wild, wild west, as it's been depicted in movies. So before any policy, any program, why don't you secure the nations first? And people are saying, the service chiefs have overstayed their welcome. But if they have been performing, or if some of them have been performing, people will not have raised issues. So the safety, the security, the peace of the country come first before anything. And in that area, the government is failing. OK, the government is failing. That's your conclusion. I, I just want to, Afegba, uh, I hope you'll be able to, you know, uh, make a good assessment of the manufacturing sector. It's been dwindling 
and uh, the growth is very minimal. When you look at uh, quarter, <coughs> the fourth quarter of 2017, for example, it was 0.14%. In the fourth quarter again of 2018, it rose very sharply uh, to 2.35%. But in the first quarter of 2019, we are talking of 0.81%. I don't know why I come to you when it's just two minutes to break <laughs> and the rest, but it, it, it's fine. I'm you sure, know. I'm sure this okay. is strategic. <laughs> 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 but, you know, you know, taking, taking off from where the single senator stopped, I think it's, it's quite worrisome, very, very worrisome, that the country has gotten to the point that constituted authority would drive tick into the forest to be negotiated with bandits. And if you, if you marry that with the general level of insecurity in the country, how much of effort do you expect a manufacturer to put up to be able to produce goods and services that will serve the interests of the common, of the common people, of the ordinary people? Where is your energy? Where is your power? Where is your electricity? They promise that, oh, electricity in six months, there will be some kind of El Dorado. Where is that? So if you do not have power, how do you want to drive your productive sector? I have friends who have big manufacturing concerns. And every day they lament that even when they get dedicated service from power, that's from Nigerian electricity, whatever, you see, the, the current are not strong enough to even propel their machines for production. And the man was lamenting, telling me how much of diesel he consumes on a daily basis. By the time you add that up to production cost, the item he's producing will have overshot the market you know, prevailing selling rate. So. Uh, okay, uh, gentlemen, we'll come back to that because we'll be uh, taking a look again at the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission. You're still watching the Arise interview. We've still got plenty more to discuss as we go on a short commercial break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview uh, where we speak to the newsmakers as well as ordinary people doing extraordinary things around the country. Okay, I still got uh, the gentleman here in the studios, uh, Kazim. I think I would want you to, you know, expatiate yes. more on yes. your submissions. Yes, I was saying that uh, I have a friend who was a very big manufacturing concern in Lagos and his worry has been the issue of uh, power. And by the time you look at the opaque nature of the power sector, they now begin to wonder what exactly is the problem. Because today they will tell you we have 3,500 megawatts. Tomorrow they will tell you they have 7,350 megawatts. Next tomorrow they will say, oh, we are producing megawatts, but there are no distribution channels to do this, to do that. I think... And of course, the EFCC uh, started probing the 16 billion power that, contract. Well, for me... A nation that wants to get on the super highway of a 21st century world must consciously and deliberately you know, uh, formulate policies that will address the critical sector that will naturally but drive the policies growth. are there. You see, listen, you there? see the power sector, mm. for example, you don't need to light up the entire country in one fell swoop. It's not possible. You have to concentrate in areas where there is huge production and manufacturing going on. Okay, ask yourself. I, I don't think that there wasn't any area, there, there's, there's no area in Nigeria where you don't have that. Is no, it the no, northwest no, that no, has been no, eroded well, now with wait, the textile industry? Wait, that's what I'm, I was coming there. Yes, I was coming there. I, I, I was coming there. Yeah. Look at Kaduna, the popular Arewa textile and all of that. Yeah. Nothing is happening there. Mm. Look at Kano, the same thing. Look at Lagos. The same thing, Port Harcourt. So what I'm saying is that you, you, you deliberately take policies that you can arrest these places and say, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to give them stable power supply. I will give you an example of what my friend was going through, such that even the currents that come to his own factory cannot 
propel the machines for production. So it's a problem. Meanwhile, he's paying more than what the ordinary person is paying for that particular dedicated line. So by the time he rolled out his frustrations and all of that, if you combine that with the level of insecurity in the country, who, you're talking about agriculture. How many people are going to, to farms these days when there are kidnappings going on and all of that? Biden was coming from his farm when he was killed. Who, who, who is motivated to go to the farm to produce? When the governor can tr carry the entire machinery of his of security details, Everything, and he's driving into the thick forest to go and meet bandits, criminals, to negotiate. You, need, you know what it means for a constitutional authority? And you see a bandit with pictures carrying AK-47, and you are negotiating. <coughs> negotiating. You are indirectly promoting banditry because the, the man who says that he can, he can summon a governor to his own conclave will say, oh, after all, I'm doing a good job. So others will p take inspiration from that. That is not the kind of narrative we want to see in the 21st century in Nigeria. And that is why I feel that the APC is rudderless. And they are romancing incompetence with relish. And it's about time they started looking inwards and take the appropriate measures to arrest the drift in the country. This country, uh, moral fiber, uh, political fiber, social fiber, is, is, is being crippled by the day. Well, uh, funny enough, uh, both you and uh, Senator, distinguished Senator Sani were uh, key members of uh, the APC, APC yeah. only uh, until recently. So you people, no you, apology both about of that. you should uh, share in that blame. But let me come to you, uh, George. The Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission has done what most manufacturers and even Nigerians have called, you know, a retrogressive increase of electricity tariff in the midst of the likes the, the like of submission uh Afegua has made for what purpose why would you increase the cost of a commodity that is that you don't even have in abundance well i think the issue of electricity the issue of electricity downturn in nigeria since the fourth republic began in 1999. It didn't start yesterday. And in my own view, what made it worse, honestly, is the privatization of the transmission and distribution companies, which many Nigerians have alluded was not done by merit. The previous administration did this, handing it over to their own cronies. And so why, why is this administration not correcting <coughs> it? Are they afraid of the P and ID uh, scenario? No, no. Well, they've, they've handed it over to their own cronies, and they are not living up to expectation. But this current administration... Government has 40% 40, 40 stake in the discos. Are you aware? I know that, but they are not living so up... So if, if your other partner is not living up to expectations, are you living... Are they, is government living up to expectation by, you know, with his own funding of 40%? Well, so far, on the personal note, I expect the government to really look into this privatization process and look for a way to rectify it because they are not living up to their own expectation. But however, let me go a little bit back to the issue of security. You know, my good friend, you know, Afebo talked about negotiating and dialogue. I don't see anything wrong in dialogue or negotiation, you know, with, with terrorists. With bandits or with terrorists. terrorists. After all, the United States of America, President Trump currently is trying to negotiate with Taliban. But in Afghanistan. But he called it off. He called it off, but, no, but, but, but he still... Not in your no, 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 no. <laughs> they no, are no. not in America. No, 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 <laughs> but they are, all, they are all the same thing. No, 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 no They are all the same thing. There is nothing wrong no, no. in negotiating. Please. I remember vividly during the Obasanjo administration, there was a time you also negotiated with some people. If we can negotiate and get it right and bring peace and tranquility to the country, 
I think it is a step in the right direction. After a late president, uh, Yara Duad negotiated with the Niger Delta militants. They were not that, criminals. And, they were not bandits. And, and, and they were brought, militants. And they were not brought, bandits. And that they brought, they were uh, they were you know, people. relative peace to that region. They were not, they were not bandits. So I think, I think it would be, I think it would be a good growth. idea if President Buhari will do exactly what President Yaradua did in respect of the Niger Delta militants why we now have absolute peace in the Niger Delta. If that is done in the Northeast and Northwest, all this mess, you know, on Kaduna highways, you know, might stop. Okay, let's just quickly look at uh, the issue of education. Most Nigerians are worried. In fact, uh, the, the uh, United Nations Agency's uh, assessments and index of out-of-school children in Nigeria, but highest, I mean, in northern Nigeria, is so worrisome. With the uh, school feeding programs and the rest, the uh, agricultural uh, revolution, I would say, that is supposed to have created a lot of value chain employment, you know, from uh, the farms, you know, to the cities and the rest, we still have millions, over 16 million Nigerian, tell Marjorie's in, in the north, out of school. Yes. Um, the statistics are factual, and they have been corroborated by a number of agencies on the ground. But when you speak about out of school children, you cannot hang it on the neck of President Muhammad Buhari. Mm. It is an abdication of responsibility by different tiers of government, from the local government to the states. First of all, it is shocking to find out that over 26 states refuse to pay their counterpart fundings to UBEC. Yeah. And UBEC is an institution of government that has been established to complement the activities of local governments as far as education is concerned. That is one issue. Secondly, you see how the budgets of the states are on education. You will shed tears. And many of them are, doesn't go beyond renovating schools that are on the highways. Those you can see. So most times, if you travel to any state capital, you are bound to see schools that are well refurbished, that are on the highways, and then you will go with an impression that that is the way the state is. And uh, out of school children, supposed to be a, a, a major issue. Uh, an emergency uh, should be declared. Yes, that uh, should be taken by all types of government. But when you talk of education generally, uh, the fact that ASU has consistently provided facts to show the lack of seriousness as far as this government is concerned on the issue of education, then it demands that as far as the president is concerned, he should understand that if there is any legacy he is going to leave behind that is most important, is one in which he has improved on the education standard he has met uh, while he assumed office. Uh, you feed children who sit on bare floors and without roofs in their schools. That is a big problem. And also, you have seen how many villages, I will still go back to insecurity, uh, have been sacked and as such people cannot, their children can not even, not even go to school. And uh, we tried when I was at the Ed Senate for us to look at the possibility of having a legislation where people in public office can have their children in school. In the, public schools. In public school. Um, but that I received a lot of <laughs> resistance <laughs> because uh, I believe that even from our wives, they will not agree that we take our children to a public school. So in that aspect, I can see that we can address the problem of these 16 million children out of school because we have the resources to do that. Only if 
there is a serious coordination between the federal government, the states, and the local government. Without that, we will continue, it will grow from 16 to 26. And if you go back to the root of our security problems, you will see that the collapse of public education at that lower strata is a contributing factor. Yes. All right. Thanks. Uh, nice that you landed there because you're still watching the Arise interview and we're going on another short break. When we return, we'll be looking at the issues of health and uh, more again on education. Stay with us. You're welcome back to the Arise interview. Say have in the studios from my far left is George Agbakai, who is a public policy analyst. And uh, in the middle there is Kazim Afegwa, a PDP stalwart. And of course, Senator Shewusani, uh, really better known for your human rights campaigns and the rest. I'll come to that because only today, uh, the Human Rights Watch, you know, released a very damning verdict on the Nigerian military who had detained several thousands of children in custody for years and the rest, you know, criminalizing them and the rest. Okay, but let's just look at the human rights uh, record of this administration. What are the areas of improvement, you know? It just probably may not be so, so bad. Well, um, one good thing about history is that it gives you an idea where we're coming from. Uh, the political establishment, the ruling political elite in power today, uh, came from a culture of protest against the establishment, protest against the system, and demand for uh, an end to what was then an order. And they have benefited immensely from our democratic leverage for one to exercise his freedom to protest and to dissent. So they, in many occasions in the past, before they come to power, uh, hold to account those who were then in position of power as being tyrannical, dictatorial, anti-democratic, and also violators of fundamental rights. Then it was expected that when they assume the position of power, they will lead by an example, but you see a complete reversal of all that they have pledged and promised to do. Uh, there is a growing uh, cloud of fear in the atmosphere in the country today. There is a growing intolerance to dissent and to uh, expression of public of opinions. We have seen the way in which the apparatus of the state has been used to crush peaceful dissent. And most times, even criticism is equated to either terrorism or incitement or sedition. Now, I have always said it that uh, this <coughs> existing ruling political elites uh, were beneficiaries of culture, of protest, and objections. And today, you see people being arrested and detained and harassed for expressing their opinion either on social media or holding public procession. And I've said it most times that President Muhammad Buhari should be concerned that he needs to leave behind a legacy of respect for rule of law and fundamental rights. He himself was a victim of violation of fundamental rights. And for such a period he took struggling and fighting to overthrow the establishment. He's supposed to be an example of what a leader should be when it comes to respect for fundamental rights. And it is wrong for people to be kept in detention uh, unnecessarily, for protests to be crushed, and that is not good for his history. Are you a member of the IMN? What is IMN? Islamic movement? Yeah. Uh, I can never be a member of the IMN. But I believe that their right to express their opinion should be defended by any person because uh, you don't have to agree with them, but you have to defend their right 
to express themselves freely. But there is a subsisting uh, court uh, ruling on uh, the illegality of uh, the movement. You see, uh, many shouldn't th uh, the, the courts be obeyed by everybody? You see, many things are done now, and I believe that in the past the people who are in power today were being accused of incitement, were accused of sub accused of supporting terror were accused of, uh, of, of uprising, were accused of so many things. So it was expected that they should do things differently. But for all those things that were raised against them in the past, which they criticized, which they brought forth as example of sadism and autocracy, you find them doing it now. And that is wrong. And see the way history is repeating itself. Uh, during the time of Jonathan, I can remember a time where he proscribed the Boko Haram group and the APC criticized him for doing that. And now they proscribe the IMN and the PDP is criticizing them for doing that. So I believe the example you should set when you are in power is that it is that respect for rule of law that will protect you when you are out of power. When those who are in power today are out of power, it is that law, that constitution of the land that will protect them. Okay. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, uh, Kazim, you, you want to you know, add your voice to uh, the human rights uh, uh, no, situation? I, I, here. Because I, I, we're just limiting this to the center in Cross River State, the governor there for mere criticism is the put a journalist in, in uh, detention, Jalingo, is still there. Anything, anything that runs contrary to the rule of law and the rights of the ordinary person should be condemned wholesomely. We shouldn't approach this issue in half measures. But I'm, I'm, I'm much, much worried with the state of our education because if you have a great number of persons who are illiterate and they can't even assert you know, themselves, or understand even their rights, chances are that cases or abuses of their rights will continue to be on the increase. What is this government doing about education? He raised very critical issues between the federal, the state, and the local government. I think in the spirit of the manifesto of the APC, I think they should do things which they have captured, which they have enunciated in their manifesto, and implement them in such a way that there will be a deliberate intervention in rescuing education from what it is now. He was talking about renovations along this. this it's a common feature. You know, now, now you, were to, you were talking about school feeding program, but you are also, you are also not taking into consideration the condition of the environment under which you are feeding these children. But there is food. No, there is, of course, not all the states, but some, some states, fine. But you can't be feeding a child under the tree in classrooms that are more like pig pens and what have you. And you expect that child to concentrate to learn. And by the time you factor that in to the World Bank, and, uh, yes, World Bank classification, of the poorest of the poor, you would understand that we are in a very precarious situation with respect to education. Okay. When, when, when the previous government talks about al majori schools, what has gone wrong with what has gone wrong with those al majori schools under an APC government and a man who, you know, is reputed to have the support of the al majoris Shouldn't it concern the president that now that I'm a president, I'm going to address your plight and take you away from this culture of street begging into the four walls of school so that you can gain knowledge and improve your life? Well, okay. <laughs> Let uh, you, you leave it there so that uh, George can quickly, in less than two minutes, look at the healthcare development in Nigeria. It's very critical. Are the policies there to really drive them? I think um, all along in Nigeria, we've always have issues regarding health. 
the so the issues that, that, so, that the, has, so the issues should be uh, continually you know perpetuated no, no, you know no, they should remain no that has been there's no way to get them off the ground no solution uh, but, no, no 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 but you also have to understand that issues of health are issues relating to federal state and local government yes. it's not a federal issue alone just like education mm. it's not a federal issue so, so in one we, minute, we, we, how we, can this be addressed? Now? I think all hands needs to be on deck. The state government need to do their part. Federal government need to do their part. And with the, you know, proposed independence of the local government, they also need you, to you do their part. You will see an improvement exactly. because they'll be they'll now be having their direct allocation, financial so, allocation. Yes, and that is that is a major thing that this government has done. I believe the I believe the feeding school feeding program, just like the Amajiri program of the previous administration, are all steps in the right direction. It's just consolidation that is really needed, gentlemen. I can't thank you, uh, the trio of you, enough uh, from my immediate left, distinguished Senator Shewu Sani, a human rights ad advocate and. Uh, former member of the Nigerian Senate in the 8th uh, Senate and of course uh, political uh, activists uh, Kazima Febua and PDP stalwart and George Agwakai, public policy analyst. Thanks very much for watching that uh, show for this edition of the Arise interview. I'm Christian Ogodo. Bye-bye.